Hello, and welcome to today's presentation about protecting your brand identity, trademarks. My name is Mary Cogut Lowell, and I'll be, I hope you find this information today very helpful. Um, I, just a little bit about myself. I'm a business and intellectual property lawyer, and I am the co-host of a podcast called the Trademark Insiders Podcast. I'm a member of the Florida, Michigan, and Wyoming Bar. So that's a little about me. Now let's talk about our agenda today. First, we'll talk about what is a trademark? Why should you consider registering a trademark? And is your trademark eligible for registration? Not every trademark is eligible. So we'll talk about why that is. We'll talk about the con a concept of likelihood of confusion, which is really important in trademark law. We'll talk about marking your mark and then finish up with international trademark law. So before we get started, a brief disclaimer. The, inf the information provided in this presentation does not constitute legal advice. All information and content is for general informational purposes only. So please contact, contact your own attorney to obtain advice with respect to your particular legal matter. Only your attorney can provide information applicable or appropriate to your particular situation. So let's get right started and talk about what is a trademark? A trademark is, above all, a source identifier. And please, rem let's remember that term today because it's really important to understanding trademarks. A trademark is a source identifier. In other words, it helps consumers identify the com company or person responsible for a product or service. Um, think about Coca-Cola or McDonald's. Those are very big and famous trademarks, particularly, per, and they are associated with particular businesses, right? So if you're talking about Coca-Cola, you know that comes from the Coca-Cola company and McDonald's, you think about, you know, the golden arches and the uh, fast food restaurants. So those are source identifiers. So a trademark is a word, phrase, symbol or design that identifies and distinguishes the source of goods or services of one party from those of, not, of others. And again, I'd mentioned McDonald's. Think about the golden arches. You see the golden arches? Don't you probably think immediately of McDonald's? So, so it is a source identifier and hence is a very strong trademark. And let's talk about the term intellectual property which refers to creations of the mind. So trademarks are a kind of intellectual property, um, but the term is actually broader. It also includes inventions, literary and artistic works, um, and again, designs, symbols, names, and images used in commerce, commerce. These are all intellectual property. And intellectual property is protected by the law of patents, trademarks and copyright, which enable people to earn recognition or financial benefit from what they have in, uh, invented or created. So patents are intellectual property, copyrights are intellectual property, and trademarks are intellectual property. And today we're going to focus specifically on trademarks. So a trademark can be a name, a symbol, or both. It works best as a source identifier if it's unique. A distinct trademark quickly and clearly identifies you as the source of your goods and services. So the stronger your trademark is, the more easily you can prevent others from using it without your permission. Do you need to register a trademark? No. You do not need to register. Legally, you're not required to register a trademark. However, registration does have its advantages and many people do choose to register their trademarks. Now, why register a trademark? Well, for, for, for a couple of very good reasons. Most importantly, registration puts other businesses on notice that your name is in use. 
so that another company that does a trademark search, we, you know, we hope we'll see your name and we'll choose uh, a different one because you've already registered, registered it. And it creates evidence of your use of the mark if there's ever a question of priority, which is the term we use to describe who started using a trademark first. So if two people start using a trademark, the same trademark, and they they are fighting over it or arguing over who has rights to it, one of the questions will be priority, who used it first. And it just helps you, it just helps you um, legally protect your interests. So for example, having registered a trademark may make it easier to get online marketplaces to act against against counter, counterfeiters or others who are improperly using your trademark. Now, where do you register a trademark? You have a couple of choices here. In the United States, you can choose to register a trademark in the state or states where you're doing business, or you can register a trademark in the United States Patent and Trademark Office. You actually could do both, although it would be somewhat redundant And I'll, I'll, uh, if you register in USPTO, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, you Registering your trademark in the United States Patent and Trademark Office in Washington gives you nationwide protection. So if you register a trademark in the USPTO, let's say your business is located in Florida, you have, primarily in Florida, I should say, you have nationwide protection. Um, you can just register in the state where you're doing business, but let's say somebody in another state, you know, that doesn't give you protection if somebody in another state starts using it if you haven't registered in that particular state. And for that reason, many businesses do register their trademarks with the USPTO so that they enjoy that nationwide protection. One other note, um, registration in the USPTO only gives you nationwide protection. It does not protect you intellectual, uh, your intellectual property um, in the rest of the world. And so if you operate in other countries, you may want to look into filing trademark registrations in other countries. And we will talk a little bit more about that at the end. Now, is your mark registrable? Not every trademark can be registered. And let me give you a couple of examples here. Generally, you cannot register a mark that's a generic word for goods or services. So let's say that I produce and I'm selling a particular kind of wonderful soap. I can't register the name soap because that's a generic word for what I'm selling. Or if I'm manufacturing a car and selling a car, I just can't tra trademark the name car because that's a generic, generic word for go goods or services. So in general, you cannot register a mark that is a generic word for goods or services. And also descriptive terms may be difficult to register. So let's say, for example, that I want to register, uh, I'm selling facial tissues and I want to call them soft and dry. Well, that may be difficult to do because that may just be a dis descriptive term of your facial tissues. Or similarly, similarly, if I'm selling sour cream, I, it's going to be hard for me to register creamy sour cream for sour cream because that's a descriptive term. So generally, you're going to want to stay away from generic or descriptive terms. Now, arbitrary terms, let's talk about those. Arbitrary terms are words that are known, but they're used in a way that generally does not describe the products or services. And arbitrary terms generally can be registered as a trademark. My favorite example is Apple for computers or cell phones. Now, if I was using Apple to sell apples, that would be one thing, but Apple for computers is an arbitrary term or Apple for cell phones and hence is registrable and is in fact a very strong trademark. So is your mark registrable? Um, well, we talked about a different a couple of different kinds of words like generic terms. There's also something called fanciful marks. And examples are Xerox and Kleenex. Um, those terms were fanciful. They were made up and originally were were uh, registrable, but eventually became generic. So now when I think about 
a, a facial tissue, I may say, give me a Kleenex. And Kleenex isn't necessarily, you know, isn't necessarily the kind of facial tissue, but it's become generic. So, but it, as long as if it's fence, fanciful, like Xerox was another one for copy, making copies, that's a fanciful mark. It's, it's a word you won't find in the dictionary and originally was registrable for that for that purpose. So fanciful marks only have a meaning in connection with that brand. So Kleenex was developed to talk about a facial tissue and Xerox was a, a fanciful term that was used to talk about um, copy machines. Those are fanciful marks that are not found in the dictionary. And so they were used to build strong protection. Um, and so that kind of fanciful words can be registered in general. So the best thing to do if you can is to choose a unique trademark. Doing so makes the registration process easier and faster, which usually also means less expensive. So businesses often try to balance the strength of an unusual brand name against the desire to use descriptive terms that will help potential customers understand goods or services. So you want to find, if you can, the best kind of trademark is something that is unique. So one thing you can do, let's say you, you have a business, you're using a particular trademark, you want to see if others are using a mark. Let's say um, let's say uh, you're in the state of Florida. Well, you can you can check the Florida database to see if somebody's using that term. And you can do the same thing in other states. So you can look in your own state or in the states where you're doing business. Or you can also search in the USPTO. There is a trademark database that's very useful. And that can give you some idea if anybody has applied for registration of that particular term in the US. Now, those, it's not exhaustive doing that. You probably would want to do even more. You know, you want to Google and, and you, you might want to hire a professional to help you uh, determine if others are using the mark. But the, the best thing to do, bottom line, is to choose a unique trademark and do your research to determine whether somebody else is already using it. I mentioned previously, there's something called likelihood of confusion. So let's talk about what that means. You will not be able to register a trademark and may face legal challenges if you choose a name that is confusingly similar to someone else's existing mark. Here are a couple of examples. Remember I mentioned previously, we're all familiar with McDonald's fast food. We all know the golden ar arches. Well, let's say I wanted to create my own fast food chain and I called it McDonald's instead of McDonald's. You're probably going to have a hard time and you probably won't be able to register that because there's a likelihood of confusion. McDonald's would certainly, almost certainly object. Um, and, you know, if you call your fast food McDonald's, it might confuse people. They may think it's the same as McDonald's and it's not. So whenever there's a like likelihood of confusion, you're not going to be able to register a trademark. Same thing for the term Hanes for t-shirts. You know, there's Hanes t-shirts, H-A-N-E-S. Suppose I want to call my Hanes t-shirts H-A-I-N-E-S. Same problem. It's a little different spelling, but it sounds the same. And there's a strong likelihood of confusion there. So you're unlikely to be able to get that registered. So even though they're not identical, a consumer could confuse McDonald's for McDonald's or Hanes for Hanes. And that's the, that's the issue there. Could a consumer be confused about the source of those products or services? If so, you're not going to be able to register a particular trademark. Now, the look and sound of words are considered. So alternate spellings or fonts usually are not enough to avoid likelihood of confusion. So remember, you, the bottom line here is you're not going to be able to register a trademark if there's a likelihood of confusion with somebody else's trademark. Now, sometimes people ask, when should I apply for registration? You have a couple of choices here. If you're registering on the federal level, you, you may file a federal intent to use application up to a year before a business starts using a mark. 
Filing based on intent to use rather than actual use does add some steps and costs. So a lot of businesses will wait until they're ready to go to market to file the application. Uh, but you have to, there is a risk if you do that. If you risk, there's also a risk that somebody else may independently come up with that same trademark and start uses, using it and registering it. So it's kind of a, you have to weigh the pros and cons in every particular case. So you do, but the important point to know is that you can file a federal intent to use up to a business before, I mean, up to a year before the business starts using the mark. And um, a federal trademark application may be filed any time after a business begins selling or offering the mark products or services for sale. So once you are using them, definitely you can apply for registration. Next, let's talk a little bit about the application process, which involves filing an application with the USPTO. And again, I'm focusing here on filings in the Federal United States Patent and Trademark Office, the application process, um, you know, each state will have its own application process if you choose to file there and you'd have to file whatever, follow whatever procedures that they require. But in general, um, the application must include a description of the mark, the goods or services with which it will be used, and evidence of use in commerce. So, so let's say, for example, um, uh, let's say the word dove bar for soap, um, and yet there's also a dove ice cream. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because they're in different, they're, they're providing different goods. So one may be filed in one class of services and one is filed in another class. That's why you need to describe, you need to state not only the mark, but you have to be able to um, identify the classes that you want registration in. So let's say, so let's say um, I have a fast food application and I, you know, a name for my fast food chain and I say it's in restaurants and fast foods. That's the, that's the class that I'm, I'm going to be filing for. Then once the application is filed, it undergoes a review process. And if the mark meets all requirements, it will be published and then third parties have an opportunity to oppose the registration. So that's kind of the process. There's an initial review. If it initially passes muster in the USPTO, it will be published. Other companies then can object and they can say, no, 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 it's confusingly similar with my mark and explain why. Um, but if, if no oppositions are filed or, you know, it's determined that it's not confusingly similar, at some point the mark will be registered and the owner will receive a certificate of registration. And it's generally taking six months to a year or even longer for that process. So it isn't something that's going to happen overnight, but that's basically it. You file the application, it's reviewed. If approved initially, it's published so that third parties have an opportunity to oppose. And then if there's no opposition or if any opposition is um, determined not to be valid, then you will receive a certificate of registration. So here's a bit more on the application process. And remember, I mentioned that you have to identify the, the classes um, that you're applying for registration. If you miss a particular good or service and or your business expands, you can file another application or add classes and describe additional goods or services within the original classes later. And it's important during the application process, keep records of everything you send and get back from the USPTO. Read notices from the USPTO and note any deadlines because missing a deadline may mean starting all over again with a new application, which would include paying fees all over again. And some people ask, do I need an attorney to register the trademark in the United States Patent and Trademark Office? If you are foreign based, you must have a US licensed attorney represent you. 
If you're domiciled in the United States, however, you are not required to have an attorney. So you have to ask yourself, if I'm not required to have an attorney, should I have one anyway? And that's something, that's a decision you'll have to make. If you hire an attorney, your application fees will be the same, but your overall costs may be higher because you'll also have to pay for your attorney. However, in the long run, hiring an attorney may save you money because an attorney will know how to best advise you on the registrability, prepare your application, and respond to the USTPO on various issues that might arise through the process. So that's basically how it works. If you're US-based, you don't need an attorney, but again, having an attorney does have its advantages. Now let's talk about infringement. What does that mean? Well, trademark infringement occurs when someone uses a mark that is either identical or confusingly similar to a registered trademark in connection with goods or services that are related to those covered by the registration. This can cause customer confusion and harm the reputation of the trademark owner. So once again, if I'm trying to, I have my fast food restaurant that I, and I sell burgers and fries and I call it McDonald's, if it's confusingly similar, one, one could say that I'm infringing upon the McDonald's trademark. So that's trademark infringement. And if the trademark owner believes that a mark is being infringed upon, the owner can take legal action to stop the infringement. This may include seeking an injunction, injunction to prevent further use of the infringing mark, as well as money damages. So it's important to, for us to know as business owners, first of all, we don't want to be infringing on anyone else's mark because there could be legal consequences. Similarly, if you have registered a mark and someone is infringing on your mark, you do have legal remedies available to you. And that is called trademark, trademark infringement, when somebody uses your mark or one confusingly similar. Now, marking your mark. You may have seen the little TM mark after a particular trademark. Well, you can use the TM mark without filing an application or while your trademark application is pending. Once your trademark is granted, you can use the R mark with your trademark. And you've seen that that's like a capital R with a circle around it. Using these markings is not required, but doing so puts others on notice that you consider the mark proprietary and may discourage copying. So many people do choose to do that because it marks your mark as one that you consider priority. So um, there's not really, I can't, I can't really think of any downsides, you know, as long as you're, you shouldn't be using the R mark if it isn't officially registered yet. Let's make that very clear. Once it's registered, you can use the R mark, but until then you can use the little TM mark after, um, and it's, it, it is optional on your part. Now, let's talk a little bit more about international trademark law, because as I said, Registering your mark in the United States Patent and Trademark Office will give you um, protection throughout the United States, but, but not beyond the United States. Trademark laws vary by country and no, there is no single international trademark registration system. However, many countries participate in something called the Madrid Protocol which allows a single application to be filed for trademark registra registration in multiple countries. Businesses operating internationally should understand the trademark laws in each country where they operate and register trademarks to ensure protection. And that pretty much concludes our presentation for, for today. Um, if you'd like to contact me, um, please email me at mcogat at COVID Legal. Um, you can visit our website, which is at www.covidlegal.com. If you'd like to see our podcast, it is available on uh, YouTube. I've given you the uh, web address here. You can also um, find our podcasts on our website, covidlegal.com. So I hope you found this um, information helpful. And let me know if you have any particular questions that I can help you with. And uh, I hope that you have a great day and are successful in protecting your trademarks. Thank you.